Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Crossing Paths Television Ministry. My name is Don Reed Sr. from Hermitage, Pennsylvania, and we appreciate all the people out there who have been watching this TV, the encouragement for Joyce and I and Ron and Mark here, and we know and thank you for supporting us, Lord. Now, I want to tell you today, this is a different ministry in a different program. We have a pastor here that is unbelievable and what he's doing to help other pastors. So listen, call somebody. And I'm going to tell you, and it's also good, Mark, I want to bring up the date, the little baby. What's going on there now? Yeah, so we talked about him before on here, how he was born with no heartbeat for five minutes, had his in internals rupture, he's had about four intestinal surgeries, needed a bone marrow transplant, so many things where uh, it was very likely he wouldn't survive any number of them, and he survived all of them, and today he's doing great. I mean, oh, he's crawling around, he's growing, he's starting to tolerate more solid foods. I mean, there's just oh, nothing no. holding him back now from, from Everybody's filling. been Very praying Scott. for you, you know that. Yeah. And your wife, you know. Oh, yeah. And it's two years, how old now, two years? Two years in January. And had yeah. all kinds of operations, right? Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah, it's Isn't just amazing. amazing huh? Yes, sir. Thank God. Hey, if, if God did it for Mark, he'll do it for you. If he did it for his son, he'll do it for you. Yeah, yeah, Amen. Right. Listen, today's show's on brokenness. So if you know anybody that's been broken or if you're broken, call some friends, call some family members, tune into today's show. I'm going to introduce you now to a personal friend of mine, Pastor David Hamer, and uh, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit how God has been faithful to bring him out of brokenness. Amen. So Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about your personal story? Thank you so much for having me on. Yes. Don, Don thank you. You know, uh, the scripture, life and death is in the power of the tongue. Mm. When I was raised, my parents were good. They loved me. I was raised in a good home, um, Catholic home. But my father, he always felt the way to make me achieve was to tell me I could always do better. And so it ended up, it seemed like nothing I did was good enough. And that was a good motivator through about the sixth grade. But when adolescence came, I just began to rebel. And I knew that I couldn't please him anyway and so I just started to do what I wanted to do, and I was an absolute rebel. Um, by the time I was in seventh grade, I was stealing liquor from my parents' cabinet, and you know, I was just a mess. And then there was a convergence, my life in the 60s. And uh, you know, when all the hippies and the, the drug revolution, uh, so this is what I was raised in, and this is what I came into. And I wasn't doing drugs through high school, but as soon as I got out of high school, I started, I left not only doing alcohol then, um, I drank all the way through high school. I actually got kicked off the football team. My career was a lot shorter than yours, but I got kicked off the football team uh, for drinking. And actually we brought stuff with us for the last road game, had it on the bus. And uh, this, was my, this was my life. I thought life was a party. And I was, that's the way I lived. And then I got introduced to, you know, drugs and started, first of all, with pot. Mm. And uh, I had a friend of mine going to college in New York City, and he, he brought some pot back for me, and I started taking drugs. One night, I had a head-on collision, brand new car. And I had drugs underneath the seat. This was the day before. We didn't have baggies then. We had white envelopes. And it, the pot slid out from under the seat when I had the wreck. I was thrown from the car. And uh, I was in the hospital. And I'm sitting there. And I knew the drugs were in the car. Two state police pull up. And I'm thinking, oh, God, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. <laughs> and I had a... I had a my room had a window by the parking lot where I saw them pull in. I thought for sure they were coming to slap the cuffs on me. And I'm praying, and I, I meant it till I got out of the hospital. My friend came to see me, and he, he went and he pulled the pot out of the car uh, after the wreck. And uh, so I came out, first thing I said, where's my dope, right? And so this is the way we lived. I had a friend of mine, he was shooting up. And he got jaundice, ended up in the hospital. The doctor told him, if you ever do drugs or drink alcohol again, you're going to die. He came out of the hospital, went into his garage. He said, watch for Debbie, his wife. He's getting his works, shooting right up again. He's dead. You know, this was my life. And this went on till I was uh, 
23 years old. Mm. And I, although I was doing drugs, I was doing a lot of drugs and alcohol. I did maintain a job, uh, but I'd get out of work you know, at night and I'd just party all night long. And uh, this was my whole life. I, I was a chef. I went to school, became a chef. I had drugs hidden with my spices, you know, because I didn't want to get caught back then. Mm. They really, you know, it was a crime then. It still may be a crime, but I mean, it was really punished as a crime then. And um, so this went on and I had a young boy came and started talking to me about the Lord. And I told him what a jerk he was because I had to keep my facade up. He was 13 years old wow. and he came and he talked how I'd been saved and all of this, and, but he said something I had never heard before. He told me that Jesus loved me. Now, my concept of Jesus was, you know, he gave us the Ten Commandments, and you better obey him. I saw God as the judge and me as the outlaw, and I was on the run. I was going to keep as far away from him as I possibly could. But then this thing where he told me Jesus loved me, I had never, it had probably been said to me before, but I had never heard it before Amen. in my heart. And uh, so I went and I was speaking with he, the man that led him to the Lord. And uh, he began telling me about conversion and being saved. And I spoke to him twice. And uh, one night I was out after the bars closed, went out and got high with my friends. It was about four in the morning. I was driving in my car. And the Lord spoke to me that everything I was involved in was demonic. It was like immediately I just sobered up. And I went, I went to the man's house. And I, of course, I got close. I ended up in the ditch. I won't go into all that story, but it woke his mother. And she came and got me. And then the man that led me to the Lord came and began speaking to me. And I said, I want to go to confession because it was all mm -hmm. I knew. And he said to me, you want to receive Christ? And I knelt down and I meant business. This is the point. You got to mean business. Amen. You, this is not something you just say flippantly. Mm -hmm. You know, the sinner's prayer doesn't work unless you mean it. Amen. 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 That's right. You know, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Yes. When we repent, then faith is activated and we can become converted. We can mm. be saved. We can be regenerated. And so I meant it. I mean, I was broken. I was weeping. I knelt down and prayed and asked Jesus into my heart. And I was instantly delivered from all the drugs. Wow. Gone. Wow. That night, never been back, never, never even been tempted. Wow. It was gone, wow. immediately mm. gone. And uh, there was other things the Lord had to get out of me. You know, I'm still, we're, we're under construction, right? We're in a process. Uh, but the drugs were gone. It's not a testimony of how great I am or anything. It's how great God's grace is. And he did it because he knows how weak I am. Mm. I was, I could not control it. I didn't, nobody, nobody, no child when they're growing up, what do you want to be? I want to be a drug addict. Nobody wants to be a drug addict. Mm. Nobody wants something like that to take over their life and to control them. Nobody wants it. But when we find ourselves in that position, there is hope. Amen. He can break every chain. There is no sin too vile for the blood of Christ to cleanse. Beautiful. There is no sinner beyond the reach of Calvary's mercy. Beautiful. The blood of Christ is powerful enough to redeem any sinner from any sin at any moment when they repent. Wouldn't that be, Dave, the Catholic Church planted the seed, but you never heard born again in the church then at that time, right? I and never did hear it. You never did, right? And that's, nothing, that's just most churches, a lot of churches, right? So you're, the, the seed was planted, but thank God you, you had to come down to where you got broken, am I right, Ron? Absolutely. Hey, we're getting ready now to take a break into this very powerful testimony on brokenness. So I really want to encourage you, you still have some time to get on the phone and call some friends and family. But we're going to break right now and go to Pastor Dawn. And here is a powerful example and lesson on something to think about on brokenness. Ladies and gentlemen, we like to do a little segment in between our programs. And the Lord gave me this about a year ago to let 
people know, let's come down to earth and see what happens after you're born again, when you become a Christian. You know, you're not perfect after you're born again. There's no instant McDonald Christianity in today's life, but some people think, and sometimes we have to grow. But the Lord has to break us, so our message today is a broken spirit. He has to work with you, people work with you, and you have to get into the Word of God. If you're not into the Word of God, you will never accomplish what God wants best for you. So he's working on your spirit. Matthew 6:34 says, Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now that means live one day at a time. Now the scripture I'm going to go to here is Psalms 51, 17. It says, The sacrifice of God, of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. God is not angry when you fall. We are Christians under construction. So he takes our spirit and he breaks it. We have areas of our lives that have to be torn down. And sometimes it takes time. And this is a vessel. And this is what you are before you got saved. And you know what? There's what happens now. The body now is broken. And you know what God does? He takes all of these different pieces. You know what he does? He starts putting them together and he makes a whole new vessel. Isn't that beautiful? Aren't you so glad that God has patience with you? And we should be patient with others. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. See, we are a jar of clay. We have a spirit in here and God wants to change our spirit. You know, he says, have this mind of God in you by faith. You just can't do it by going to church. You've got to read the Word of God. And it says, to show that the surpassing power belong to God and not to us. We can't change ourselves, people. We need to die daily. That's what Paul says. We die daily. That doesn't mean you're born again, born again. You're saved. You're a Christian under construction. But God loves enough to tell us that we have to change. And you know what? Going to church is good. Being good is going to church. Helping people out is good. Making fellowship is good. But if you don't realize that the Word of God is what changes your mind and your heart, your body, soul, spirit, it has to be changed. You're broken. And you know what happens after a period of time? You go around and you find out that God has planned for you. Now, after a while of working with you, guess what? You have a beautiful vessel. Isn't that nice? This is what you look like after you become a Christian. Now, I know some people don't actually look that way, and I know I don't at times. But what I'm trying to say is, God blessed, broke my spirit down. I was saved 42 years ago, but I'm still a Christian under construction. So remember, when I take these little pieces of glass here and everything and put them together, that's God working on you. But you know what? People don't like change. I'm not sure about you, but I don't like change. I know one thing. My God shall supply all my needs according to His, and His purpose. And Lord, people don't understand. And we try to tell you out here today from Crossing Paths to show you through testimonies, through little teachings here. It isn't how long, people, that you give a testimony. It isn't how long you preach. It's how long, how long, how long you will trust God. Trust God with all your heart and lean not to thine own understanding. I want to go to one more scripture here too. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Behold, all things become new. When you pick up this Bible here and you start reading the Bible, I didn't know where Matthew, Mark, and Luke with John was. Oh, everybody knows the Bible, supposedly. I just knew where Genesis was. I didn't know anything about the Ten Commandments. But God started working for me, and he was patient with me. In the book of James, it talks about patience. Are we going to be patient with our sons and our daughters and our family and our neighbors? Wasn't God patient with you? He waited. When Noah built the ark, he was very patient. And finally, when he closed the doors, 
doors were closed and eight people went into the yard. Can you think now, do you think it's just a place in the last days here that the doors are gonna be closed? The doors are gonna be closed very closely. So just remember, if God's doing something for you, it's because he wants to break your spirit. Thank you, Dawn, for that message. And we're back here with David. We're gonna continue his testimony. So David, you had a conversion, a real conversion experience. How did your life change after that? Well, you know, the folks that led me to the Lord, they gave me more than a message. They gave me a bedroom. You know, they extracted me from mm. the lifestyle. And I had to be extracted from my friends, uh, the people that I ran with, because, you know, the lifestyle they were in, it just didn't work. And so they became, they mentored me, and they began helping me and praying with me and, you know, being there for me. Um, and I began to transform. The Lord began to really work in my life, began to deliver me from other things. The hardest thing I ever did was quit smoking. Mm. I mean, I struggled with it, went on and on trying to get rid of it. Wow. But the Lord made me work through that part um, where I was instantly delivered from the drugs. But after my conversion, I felt called to the ministry. And I was a Bible consumer. I mean, I just... <laughs> could not get enough. I read every book I could get my hands on for a period of like two years. I went to Bible school. I was in Bible school, and the Lord called me out of school to take this little work in Attica, New York. This is during the Jesus People movement. And I went, and all these hippies and different folks were getting saved and filled with the Spirit. People were being healed. We had a significant move of God there. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, 40 years ago. And then uh, I made full circle. I'm back there after 40 years, which is a bit longer that we may get into that as we move into uh, the next week's program. But in my pastorate, after I pastored in Attica, I began traveling across the nation. I spent most of my adult life traveling, speaking in churches, um, I wrote several books, recorded a few albums, um, songwriter, and we ministered. We traveled, Carol and I, we crisscrossed the nation, mm. went into many nations as well. Wow. And then I had a lady that I had pastored uh, 40 years ago that asked to see me. And I came to see her and she said, my David, my David, I prayed that God had let me see you before I died. And she said she was praying and the Lord told her I was to return to the Attica area. This was not on my radar. Mm. I had retirement property purchased. I was 65 years old. And who moves to New York when you're 65? <laughs> Everybody moves out of New York when you're 65. That's right, you're headed south yeah, usually. Right. So I mean, and I thought, well, people get old, they get senile, you know? <laughs> and that was my first reaction. But I was driving down the road and 36 hours later, this lady passed away. And I could not get this out of my mind. Mm. And so, Make a long story short, um, there was a property there. Carol and I had been working in high-end lodges and resorts across the nation, helping to support our ministry. And four, four and a half miles from where I pastored, there was this beautiful 12-bedroom estate. It was a vegan health spa that had been built in 2010, closed in 2012, and it was sitting there empty. Mm, wow. And it was, it was an expensive building. At that time, they were trying to just unload it at a million, which was way less than what it was built for. It might as well have been 10 million. There's no way. You know, I'm a ministry guy, I didn't have that kind of money, and even to buy it on time. And, uh, but I went and the Lord, through a series of miracles, opened the door for us to secure that property. I literally had an, an agreement with the owner to purchase it for half of what he built it for. Mm. And he was gonna hold the note. And when he went back to Ireland where he was from and found out he would have to pay interest on the, he would have to pay taxes on the interest, he told me he'd never sell it to me. Well, this was in May and I was praying, the Lord said, you'll be in there by Christmas. And so I went to my summer employment in Maine. I got done with the employment, instead of going uh, out in ministry, I went back to the property and I just prayed. I prayed from the end of August till early November. 
and I prayed with my pastor, David Minor Sr., which Pennsylvania folks, many will know, uh, and others. And he asked me about my vision, which is a vision to have a place where we can serve church leaders. You know, I've been at this for over 40 years, and there's a deposit in me. Mm. And I want to help folks. I want to strengthen leadership. And by strengthening leadership, you strengthen past, you strengthen the churches they represent. Yes. And so as my pastor was praying with me, he said, that's a great vision, Brother Hamer. It's going to take a great, great God. And the man dropped his price the next morning by a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. Well, he told me he'd never sell it to me, so I had gone to Quicken Loans, and I had been approved for a note just $25,000 less than his current asking price. So I called him, and he agreed to sell it to me, which was half the price he turned down in May wow. that we had an agreement on. Wow. I bought the building 25 cents on a dollar for what it was built. And I walked into this property, and just as the Lord told me I would be there by Christmas, on Christmas Eve, Carol and I had our first dinner by the fireplace. Wow. And, and, and since I've been there, we do two things. We work and we worship. And as we worship, the presence of God has just filled the house with his presence. And now we're inviting people to come and we're ministering to the folks again. What's gather. the name of it again, in case you want to look at your website? Yes, it's River Spring Lodge, and that's just riverspringlodge.com. It's an amazing place. We are, we're one of four four-star hotels in the Buffalo what, region. What's the location again? We're in Darien Center. We're 30 miles from Buffalo. Let me ask you a question, too. So really, pastors, one of your dream is for pastors who have problems, right? I mean, no, they don't have to have problems, but you're... Part of your vision is to help out the pastors, am I right? Right, to have a place where pastors can come and be refreshed. Refreshed, You know, yeah. they're constantly giving out. Amen. And to have a place where it's focused on their need rather than the need of the people. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's really a, go a goal. A pastor's need to have relaxation. Maybe they don't have no problems in a sense, but they need to get away. And that's why... I really believe that you ought to listen in to next week and have your pastor listen in because Absolutely. if they don't have the money, you understand you let them come by faith, right? Yes, we'll, we'll, we're going to help folks who can't afford to come. He, he's, he's willing to do this. So you've got to tell people next week. You know, we always close play this program with salvation. Salvation is free, but discipleship is costly. So if you have a chance today to tell somebody about, but mostly tell them about Jesus, you know, you can just believe. The Bible says, and believe and receive. And you can believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died on the cross for you, and rose from the grave. And you know what? He'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Isn't that nice? Amen. Now, we're going to go to a song here. I'm going to tell you something. This man not only has a heart for the helping other pastors, but he also he still does some singing. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. Listen to this song, and maybe sure, next week, turn in, yes. okay, to hear the balance of this program. The song is The Leper cured. Lamb of God, unblemished pure, at Calvary, this leper cured. Washed in your blood, sinner redeemed, a leper one. Spotless and clean Washed in your blood Sinner redeemed A leper once Spotless and clean For my lost soul You bled and died At Calvary Lamb crucified. Out of each wound, Jesus, you bore my miracle of rebirth. Pulled. Out of each wound, Jesus, you bore my miracle. From the 
conquers rise in Christ adorned you bid me come through curtain torn in I fall down on my knees to kiss each that bled for me. In awe, I fall down on my knees to kiss each wound that bled for me. Within my soul, one passion burns for Christ alone. My spirit yearns all at your feet, my God, my King, my heart, my soul, my everything, all at your feet, my God, my King, my heart, my soul, my everything. On holy ground, in worship rare, the breath of God, this sacred air. Revival winds, God's breath of life, My soul tonight. Revival winds, God's breath of life. Breathe upon my soul tonight. From lepers' rags, in Christ adorned, you bid me. Curtain tall, in I fall down on my knees to kiss each wound that bled for me. In all I fall down on my knees. 